Um, so welcome everyone to another meeting of the Australian Sensitive Data Interest Group. Um, this is an interest group that's co-facilitated by the ARDC and the Australian Data Archives. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we're meeting um, and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. It's um, different peoples all across Australia, but for me, I um, pay my respects to the Wajak Noongar people. Steve, who is one of our co-chairs um, of this interest group, uh, will be talking to us today about the cadre conceptual framework. So the way that the cadre project is um, conceptualising and operationalising the five safes model, um, which is a really interesting piece of work. So I'm, yeah, I'll, I'll stop talking and let Steve tell us about it. Alrighty. Uh, yes, I'm off mute. So I'm going to share, resume the share that I've got on. Can I just get confirmation, Nicola, that the screen is, the slides coming through? The slides are coming through. Excellent. Wait. It's, a, it's always the, the best of intentions. You share, you test, and still got to make sure afterwards. Okay. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on the uh, the lands of Ngunnawal people here in Canberra and, the, uh, um, and you know, acknowledge, you know, um, Liz past, present, and emerging um, of the, the uh, Ngunnawal people. Um, I'm joining you today, yes, to talk a bit about the, the, the Cadre conceptual framework and uh, tell you a little bit about the project. Um, uh, and, and where it's come from, um, uh, who's involved, and then get into uh, really you know, what the intent of the Cadre project is and how we th we've gone about thinking about um, how we might apply fundamentally the five safes um, in, a, in an academic environment. Um, I've got a, you know, a, a cast of thousands and the, the partners we have there. I'm actually going to come back to a, a repeat of you know, that uh, in a little moment as well uh, to talk that through. I'm going to talk for about half an hour today um uh nicola's going to make some uh, some strange noises or Kristen is at uh, around about you know 25 past the hour um so that we've got plenty of time for discussion at the end uh, i got a lot of content and i will probably glide over some of it um in the interest of time um but as i am i'm really talking to uh, the outcomes of a uh, the, the framework report which I'll, I'll touch on in a moment um, if you're interested you know in in reading 60 pages or so of how we're thinking about this uh, and, and providing comments. So I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, as I say, we have you know, lots of people online. Um, I know many of you. Um, just say, if, if I just ask people, it's quite helpful to have where you're from um, uh, um, as well. Uh, and if people are, are able to rename, um, just to indicate their, their organization as well, it's quite useful to get a sense of where our community is coming from as well. If I could just ask that in advance, um, you know, if, if the opportunity is there. Uh, I know uh, there's a bunch of you know, colleagues from uh, from my team here at ADA, and I know many of you, uh, and look forward to, to meeting more of you as well as part of the, the interest group. Okay, so Cadre. Um, let's make sure we're functioning okay. Um, a, a little bit about the project itself. We'll talk about an, an overview of the framework, how we're uh, conceptualizing the five safes. You might go, well, hasn't this been done before? Yes, this is really kind of a review of where some of the thinking has gone. Um, and really then how are we turning it into a, a, um, uh, an operationalizing the, the, the five safes to become something that goes from what is fundamentally a principles-based model. Um, its origins are with actually um, the Office of National Statistics um, in the UK in a collaboration with my um, partner organization in the UK, the UK Data Archive, are actually the origins of, of where the five safes came from. Uh, and we've been working with some of the originators of the uh, the model itself to think about how do we extend this from a, a model that supports access to government data um, to one that actually might support you know, data sharing more generally, uh, particularly amongst the academic community. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to some of the context as to you know, what drove that as well. So um, a, key, a key element of Cadre, uh, and I'll get into quite what we're doing though, is the, the partners we have involved. Um, so we have a, a number of universities um, who are involved. Uh, I'm at the, at the ANU, um, the uh, Centre for Big Data and Health, uh, the, who run the Erica system at the University of New South Wales, uh, Louisa Jorman and her team, um, Amira Yani and the Swinburne Social Data Analytics Lab uh, and Research Graph um, uh, uh, with, with Peter Batts, who worked closely with, uh, with that team. 
um, the Graduate School of Education at the University of Melbourne, um, Julian McLeod, Kate O'Connor and Nicole Davis, um, and uh, from the University of Queensland, Mark West and, and the Institute of Social Science Research, who've been a lot of our advisory committee. We're doing some further work with them as well. Um, we have government agencies, um, uh, Institute of Health and Welfare, the Institute of Family Studies, um, who in the context of of the, the Data Act, uh, sorry, the Data Act, the Data Access and Transparency Act, are two of the accredited um, integrating authorities uh, of the six that exist in Australia. Um, we have a number of e-research providers as well. Um, ARDC um, as, a, as a major partner, uh, Australian Access Federation um, as a key technology provider, uh, Arnet Research Graph and, and Oren, Australian Urban Research Infrastructure Network as well. And it's really this collaboration which is kind of drives the thinking of, of uh, what Cadre is trying to do, which is how do we, as I said, how do we turn from a principles-based model to a model where we can actually share information about um, enabling access to data? Um, so um, uh, Cadre started uh, through a $1.9 million investment. Um, here's the, you know, uh, uh, the formal acknowledgement slide, but it's important to, to understand this as well, uh, investment from uh, the Australian Research Data Commons as part of the INQUIS um, uh, national strategy, uh, and we match co-investment funds from project partners. So we're you know we're looking at a project budget of you know a bit over three point eight million uh, overall over um, a two and a half year period. Um, and I want to acknowledge, say, like this: the, the work I'm going to talk about today really comes from a collaborative effort from the Cadre Conceptual Working Group, um, Work Package One Working Groups. Uh, and, and Greg Darcy, I have to acknowledge um, verbally because say, he was involved in this work as well. Um, uh, but to say a, a, a wide cast you know, who really provided you know, strong input from across that range of community um, uh, participants. This really is how do we understand the movement between the different parts of the, um, the research and, and um, academic and government sector uh, to coordinate uh, on these efforts. Um, so why cadre? Well, the context of this really was the five states and the DAD Act um, that's just passed. So we've heard from the, in, in this um, interest group on a regular basis from the Office of the National Data Commissioner. Um, really, this was the driver also for establishing uh, cadre as well, which was to say we could see, you know, there was now a kind of a, both a legislative framework, but also an impetus for thinking about um, coordinated access to um, sensitive data. Um, but um, uh, but some limitations on that as well, which I'll, I'll turn to. What we're trying to do is sort of work on an information requirements based approach to support going from principles to practice. You know, how are we going to scale this up when we actually have to put you know some of this work in place? And we're not limiting ourselves here um, to government data. In fact, how do we actually coordinate between academic environments as well as government and you know progressively private and non-government sector as well? to support access to qualitative and quantitative social science research data, and then you know, more broadly research data for research data. And really looking at a, a mechanism for enabling decision support for managing decisions around access to, to sensitive data um, through a dashboard type model supported by a number of key technologies, which I'll turn to at the end. So the inspiration you know, certainly was the, the Office of the National Data Commissioner work program. Um, as a foundation for access to government data, you know, it kind of provided, you know, a, a driver for us to be able to engage in these conversations um, with both the academic and government sector. But the big gap that we have is, say, being principles based. Um, uh, hi, Jenny. <laughs> well, welcome. Um, is that there really isn't infra integrated infrastructure that exists to support turning principles into practice here. And that's you know part of what um, uh, Cadre is trying to do. We are not trying to provide a secure data lab. Um, uh, we're not trying to provide data integration services. What we're trying to do is provide an information you know exchange environment um, for enabling the the management and coordinating coordination of data sharing between academia and government. Um, so fundamentally, an information model that allows um, uh, the exchange of um, that information uh, effectively between those who might provide data, those who might provide data access services, such as those secure you know, service providers uh, and research and users. And we're taking a, a broad remit here on researchers, um, you know, first and foremost academia, but you know, those certainly sitting inside government agencies, ADA has a strong uh, um, uh, user um, community inside um, state and federal government. Uh, and you know, certainly into uh, those other sectors as well. 
and what are some of the logistical challenges of that. Um, and fundamentally, it's trying to deal with the challenges from the absence of that, that infrastructure to scaling access procedures, um, coordinating secure services. What if I've got my content in one system and I need to move it to another? Um, connecting into the full stack of infra you know, um, infrastructure providers that might exist and then coordinating some of the underpinning, you know, NRI, and this is where AAF, RNET, and, you know, uh, ARDC, uh, and ORIN, you know, start coming into the, the equation here as well, um, that we have these national investments. How do we make best use of and provide relevant, you know, information to those um, uh, uh, NRI investments? So the value being gained is from, you know, improving the access process and, and building trust in the systems itself, filling the gap between, you um, uh, the 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 infrastructure that already exists connecting the dots fundamentally so there's an information exchange platform uh to uh, say to, to operationalize the five safe framework and establish a shared and distributed sensitive data access management platform for the social sciences related um uh, disciplines is the drivers that's there uh and as i said it's really building upon um the the framework that came out of the uh, the office of the national data commissioner so um, what, are, what in the end do we intend to do? We're trying to increase the speed at which um, social sciences and related disciplines get access to sensitive data. Um, we're trying to reduce the risk, time and costs associated with providing access uh, and um, for data holders as custodians. How do we, you know, um, it, it sort of should support a risk management framework and accessing data for researchers. How do we speed up the process of requesting, um, exchanging information, exchanging, you know, knowledge about services, you know, secure settings, um, uh, you know, uh, personal background, et cetera, uh, you know, in, in a, a, a trusted environment. So how are we doing this? Through a, a shared distributed data management platform and common accreditation and information exchange protocols, building off foundations like, um, you know, the, the single sign on an AAF um, uh, models that, you know, the, the, that have already been well established extending those to think about um, how do we connect into, you know, things like um, uh, Scolix and Research Scrap for exchanging, you know, known information about publications and, and practices. How do we extend that into other environments like um, uh, ethics, you know, ethics systems, you know, um, uh, you know, potentially the data place platform, you know, and, and, um, and can, for exchange of information on projects and the like. So what are we trying to do? Enable data owners and users to address their core concerns around the governance, creation, management, and sharing of sensitive data, and be able to eventually share and move sensitive data safely between the different elements within the overall research environment. Okay. So, you know, if we're thinking about that as a, as a user experience, moving from where people are completing one-off standalone uh, manual processes often involving emails uh, paper forms signed documents into a coordinated environment where we can share and reuse information from projects data and outputs in a coordinated and integrated way you already know this about me you have my orchid information why can't we leverage that information that's there um, so for custodians how do they you know coordinate to know, um, you know move from one-off isolated projects to a, you know a, a a transparent, auditable um, framework for you know sharing on upon approved projects and data sharing agreements, um, in understanding the the context for an application, um, to be able to coordinate people, projects, and data into a into a, a coordinated system, to enable that information to be delivered um, instead of a, on one off bases in, into um, uh, and you know a system that allows you know establishment of identity. Uh, single sign-on services, leveraging national identity providers um, through seamless transfer of information, and you know, progressively um, into managing outputs. So we know where, where outputs have gone. We can tie them to projects, people, and the settings that generated them. So we have both a means for understanding the, you know, the flow of information into and out, out of um, secure settings, uh, but also to understand then you know, potentially uh, the value added that comes from enabling access to, to research data in this way through the, you know, the transfer and coordination of that information uh, and the work we're doing, particularly with um, Research Graph and Swinburne uh, and, and EMEA um, is, you know, really valuable in this regard uh, to understand what's, you know, what's the longer term research and policy impact um, of 
you know, the, the, these sorts of you know, data access models. Uh, if you want to know more, I'll come at you then. There's a, a project website, um, cardrave5safe.org.au, um, and you can get in on that. Um, Yolanti Jones, who's our um, uh, community outreach officer, uh, is on uh, online as well, uh, is on the call, and uh, uh, is more than happy to talk to, to anyone and everyone about what we're doing. Um, so, yeah, say, so, uh, see, really, Yolanti, clap your hands there. Um, but fundamentally, what we say is really a value proposition to move us through, you know, the exchange of information that was about things we already know, ethics approvals, identity, um, managing possibly coordinated training. Um, so, you know, acknowledgement of approved and accredited training into time systems, into secure services, um, and exchanging that with a number of um, uh, partner providers of secure environments. ADA here becomes a user of. Um, the, the cadre service, as does Oren, Data Co-op, uh, and Arnett, and, and Research Graph. So we, we're all you know, working into this coordinated exchange uh, to progressively enable those outputs to be you know, effectively managed over time, you know, leading to publication. And that we should be able to progressively fill the, 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 the gaps on what is largely a very large knowledge graph, fundamentally, is a, a graph model for really enabling that exchange of uh, information about information across the five safes. And permanent identifiers, I'm sorry, persistent identifiers become a key part of this story, which I'll come back to at the end of the presentation. Okay, um, so right now we're on the conceptual model. Um, we're working on our technical architecture and, and, and uh, early de um, uh, software development uh, and engaged in outreach and training. I'm focusing here on the conceptual model, um, but we'll have, um, if you're interested, um, the outreach and training, we'll be talking more at uh, e-research at a workshop on, um, uh, the first, on the Monday at the e-research conference. Okay, I'll skip over that one. Um, so the framework itself is built upon this um, publication. Uh, so I have links at the end. Um, uh, yep, uh, Yolanti's dropped the link into the, the chat as well. Um, this is really, the, the, the presentation is really an overview of what you know, the, the, uh, we found in the, uh, in the conceptual framework. And it's trying to do two things, draw together how academia, government, and e-research providers think about um, you know, the five safes um, in a, as a, a conceptual model and what's the sorts of information you need to uh, have there. And then trying to connect it to the sorts of information uh, resources that we either have or could potentially develop that would allow us in the longer term to uh, build up that, you know, uh, connected graph. So if you're not sure at this point, the five safes themselves, um, uh, uh, there are two, um, you know, so two sort of broad uh, areas. The original uh, work was done by Felix Ritchie and, and colleagues um, uh, outlining the five states itself. Uh, progressively, the Office of the National Data Com Commissioner has turned that into the, the, the data sharing principles. And those are the, the, the principles that are defined in the, uh, the National Act. Um, we wanted to take that further again and say, okay, well, how do we uh, then think about that as more generic principles? They say these are legislated um, under the Data Act um, but you know, are they also transferable into other data sharing arrangements that we might consider? Um, so we went back into the you know the original framing of the the five safes and said you know does it how does this work? How might the, the specifics work? Uh, and then said okay, well, what might we need to extend uh, actually in this as well? So um, firstly, the, the one of the keys to the five safes is that they're both joint and severable. Um, the the model is designed that you should be assessing each of the the safes is a safe person, safe project. Uh, safe data, safe settings, and safe outputs uh, independently, but that you also need to consider them jointly. That it's not a you know um, uh, you know uh, just on one or the other. That they that, so these things often interact you know pretty effectively. You know, so less safe data can potentially be enabled access through more safe settings uh, and and safer controls over people. Uh, and vice versa. So they are jointly, uh, so jointly and severably accessible, and that becomes important in understanding you know things going forward those joint uh, assessments that are, are occurring so what we we're trying to understand that they say the five safes are understood reasonably well as principles but there's inconsistency in their application in specific circumstances and back to my point about the the range of partners you know even amongst the group you know group of partners how do we actually articulate what we mean by a safe person or a safe project is going to vary so we're not trying in this framework to say this is what a safe person is. What we're trying to do is say, what is the information you would want to be able to make an assessment um, 
um, Marcus, <laughs> I, I'd say on your question there, yes, we're engaging in conversations with the ABS on this. Um, so I'd say um, the early days, but you know, absolutely, um, we, we can talk to that. Um, so uh, the principles are there. How do we actually put those into practice becomes you know becomes pretty key. Uh, and it's say, and it's saying you can choose what you determine to be a safe person. What is the information you would need to make that assessment? And then when you, we do that comparison, we actually find there are some common information requirements across a lot of groups. Well, the variation particularly between academia and, and government and between different research methodologies. And this is where the work, particularly from our um, qualitative uh, research colleagues at Melbourne Uni became particularly informative. Um, when you're using different methodologies, the sensitivities and the, um, the research traditions are going to inform your assessment as well. So the content working group identified indicators of interest for information requirements, and then say, and then we, we we talk through those in detail in the conceptual framework itself. So I'm just trying here to summarise um, uh, uh, the framework. I want to make this point at this uh, point at this point as well, which is this is a living document. Um, we are iterating on this over time. Um, and we welcome feedback, input, discussion about this. Um, there are some specific limitations and, and, and things missing from the framework that we readily acknowledge. And the most obvious of those is actually Indigenous um, uh, contributions here. Um, and we, we, we're working, uh, I'm, I'm part of the Indigenous Data Network um, uh, uh, work in the Haas Commons, uh, where we're, we're going to be you know, exploring this uh, with the um, Indigenous Data Network as well. Uh, so, you know, comments, feedback, input is, you know, utterly, you know, um, utterly and, and you know, desirable from our point of view. We want this to continue to evolve as our understanding evolves. So in that context, the sorts of things that were coming up, and I will, you know, let's say, I, I, again, in the interest of time, I might flash over some of the specifics here, but um, I'll, I'll highlight some, some particular examples. There's a, you know, some pretty good discussions on each, each, of, the, um, uh, each of the areas. Um, uh, that as I'll invite you to read in the, the framework itself. The sorts, of, you know, um, this is, do they have technical skills, experience training using confidential data? Do we follow procedures? Um, but the sorts of things that the, the content working group, what's your past track record like? Often in data sharing, particularly amongst academics, what have you done before? Um, who do you work with? Institutional affiliation becomes a particularly critical one. Uh, and, and, and say that becomes quite important under the DAD Act as well. Who, who, who you are, who, under whose remit and under whose rules are you actually undertaking your work uh, and there are some examples of this the global alliance for genomic health um, are both and the inter-university inter consortium of political and social research um, uh, my colleagues at the university of michigan that the u.s social science archive have developed this idea of researcher passports and that's one that's kind of picking up ga for gh is part of the elixir um, bio uh, biomedical infrastructure in europe and we're drawing on a lot of their work My mouse button only seems to work on certain screens. Um, so, safe people. Where did our safe projects go? Oh, I've lost it. Okay. Um, safe data. Um, we have um, things like um, confidential. You know, what might what me might we include in you know, assessments of um, safe data? Confidentiality and privacy, obviously, sensitivity and security. Um, but the sorts of things that were coming up from the content working group, what utility is, is the data actually useful for the purposes of, of, of um, is it faithful to the, in critical ways to the original data? And is it analytically valid if you do make it accessible um, under, you know, um, if you do happen to remove, you know, anonymize some of the content? Um, is there relevant contextual information to a, to, you know, um, enable access to it uh, more effectively? Um, does uh, treatment undermine actually undermine its usability? You know, is it, you know the data quality integrity you know degraded? There is you know often in the the safe data um, discussions this trade off between you know uh, anonymity or well, privacy and and utility fundamentally, and how do we manage that trade off effectively? And there are lots of models for doing this. And, you know, we're not proposing one one specific approach. Um, how do access conditions place constraints uh, on access to the data, um, including those that you know at the time of data collection? Uh, and what are the impacts on all particular different data types? You know, um, both you know the the type of data you know that you've collected, whether it's interviews or you know specifically you know if it's video data, what are the implications for privacy? You know, it doesn't mean that it can't be used, but you know what are, what are the uh, the trade offs you have to make there? Um, you, access to conditions start becoming a very interesting sort of discussion. I'll pick up quickly on those. Um, 
uh, because this feeds into the GA for GH um, uh, discussion as well. The sorts of things that you know, people, um, custodians are often looking to place limitations on or manage uh, in terms of a risk framework is user characteristics, certain types of users, certain types of purposes, safe projects fundamentally. So we don't like commercial use or, or we would, you know, commercial use under certain circumstances, under, um, you know, uh, under approved circumstances. Might be time limitations, might be you need review of outputs, uh, what, are, what other documentation might be need confidentiality agreements. It might need specific data sharing agreements and the like. These, these might need to be negotiated, but there's certainly things that could possibly be established as, you know, in the information model. And how do we manage the movement and the, you know, the, the acknowledgement of that information. Um, safe settings, you know, really um, is, um, have all parties taking reasonable steps to ensure data will be used in an appropriate, safe and secure environment. We didn't dig too far into safe settings other than to say, well, what, how do we get some, some broad description of the, you know, the type of, of safe setting that we're dealing with? And this is one that will probably come up further as the, um, for those of you who are interested, um, as the accreditation of um, data service providers goes through in the uh, under the Data Act, so you know we can expect to see a lot more conversation on this. Um, but things like the physical environment, the IT environment, and the training in the use of those settings—is that a characteristic of the setting? I've been trained to use the shore environment, or is it a characteristic of the person? And it's actually a bit of both. This is this joint and severable discussion starts to come through. So. Um, What's useful is to say, we're now starting to see uh, you know, um, uh, uh, models starting to come through for trying to capture broad, at least a broad brush way, you know, ways of describing those different contexts. So a bit of work from um, uh, George Alter, who used to run the ICPSR, uh, and colleagues in the UK working on the Science and Technology, Technology um, Council, um, the, the joint facilities in, um, <coughs> in the UK. Uh, I've been thinking about this. Excuse me, I'm recovering the cold. This is one way they've got of, of a quick way of describing three elements: access methods. You know, and you may disagree with these, and we debate these in the paper. But we we can describe broad classes of the type of access method that you have: remote access, a remote service where you submit submit a batch code and it gets a return, an enclave. You may have other models, but there are ontologies we can probably build. And I'll go into some more of those in a bit later on. Similarly, <coughs> the, where it's likely to come up, and this is one of the scalability problems, is how do we actually put together a, a model around safe outputs? So checking content on the way out of a, a secure environment uh, prior to it being released. And some of you run um, these sorts of services. There's a heavy manual process usually involved in a lot of, particularly the virtual lab environments, um, or they get, you know, in, in some technologies, they get hard coded into, you know, um, a particular um, technology rules. So the ABS table builder has a, you know, explicit way of expressing what is fundamentally a safe outputs model. Any sort of database query system is really, you know, going to have some expression of what is safe or unsafe output uh, or, or notions of safe. So we might want to, you know, look at class, you know, ways of describing those. Fundamentally, though, we had five broad areas um, for review. You know, we went through the overall approach and you can read through you know, uh, some of the discussion of how people think about those uh, in, in the framework, the specifically how it might apply to qualitative um, uh, data sources you know, um, from, in, from point of view of the social sciences. And this was specifically the work of the, um, the, the, the SOCI team at um, University of Melbourne. What sorts of extensions we might need to consider to the five safes, and we have two in particular. And where are the, the joint and several application? Where are the interactions that occur? And then what sorts of information and data models could we possibly use for this? Just, I'm going to move. Uh, oh, yep. Thank yeah. you. Excellent. Um, I'm going to move forward quickly to say uh, some of the, there's some quite clear qualitative data implications um, uh, that, that provide some interesting challenges, not insurmountable challenges. Um, and and Julie and, and, and the team have uh, actually written quite extensively a couple of publications, but there'll be one um, uh, coming soon around, you know, particularly applying the five safe to quality, qualitative data um, that we'll be looking to publish soon. Um, uh, there'll be an output of this. The, the two particular extensions we think though that are needed, and this fits in very nicely with, you know, sort of our, um, uh, our, our partner model, um, is really around organizations and groups. 
So particularly organisations, who do you work for? What's your affiliation? How do we, ex we have good models for expressing that um, in um, in the, the academic sector. And AAF, you know, you know manages a lot of this um, as an access and authentic, you know, authentication provider, uh, along with the, the institutional, you know, um, uh, uh, connections into into those services across the uh, the, the academic sector and some of the, the the government sector as well. You know, any sort of single sign-on model is really premised around this. You know, this notion of affiliations and uh, and access and authentication. But we need to better understand the roles of people in organisations to really allow us to establish things like legal status, resources, and infrastructure. We you know, what are, what what does that bring with you? And this is really expressed pretty clearly in the DAD Act as well. Um, many of your institutions might be seeking accreditation under the DAD Act and Data Place. Fundamentally, what they're doing is accrediting your, your institution rather than you as an individual. You can only get access by virtue of first your, in, your organization being accredited first, providing those sorts of structures there. So how do we fundamentally provide an exchange model for that? The second one is groups. Um, so how do we deal with the fact that people work within teams and organizations, those often cross organizations? Um, we have projects that aren't actually very well expressed anywhere. Um, we have data, um, we, we, we have them in data sets and we often have them in collections. All these things often require grouping, particularly the grouping of people becomes the starting point for that. Um, and we, we're looking at technologies that allow us to do a, a better job of that grouping and particularly uh, one that's ca called CI Logon uh, that um, uh, we, I'll, I'll touch on uh, in a moment. We see a lot of interactions though. You can't really understand people, you know, um, the data custodians tend to assess the characteristics of the person, what sort of organization they work for and understand the project. You know, for, so for example, so a researcher working in a for-profit company that's conducting research on a pro bono public benefit basis, you know, is that, you know, acceptable or not? Or is the benefits largely private? So those interactions occur. Similarly with, you know, data and settings, settings and outputs and the like. We, we work through where some of those interactions actually occur, where you might have to have signals for this depends a lot on that. There's a lot of conditionality that actually tends to occur. And a, a simple, a, a good expression of that is how we understand thinking about safe data and safe settings. The sort of processing we do um, on data that's going to be open, you know, and accessible through open data, um, you know, uh, systems, uh, things like, you know, a CCAN or, um, you know, data.gov and the like need much heavier processing if there's, you know, disclosure risk than is going to be the case, uh, one that's going to be accessible through a safe setting in particular. Um, so, but then you also want to be thinking about, well, what processing do you need to be doing on reviewing the outputs coming out the other end? So we have different interactions going on uh, as we go through. And so really, I say what we, we end up with is um, the, the five safes model. There we go. Um, and, you know, uh, an articulation of how we're thinking about the five safes, but particularly the extensions into safe organizations and safe groups and enabling us to understand those groupings of settings within, you know, data projects within groups as an expression that eventually becomes um, an information exchange of the cadre platform. That's the, that, you know, these are the sorts of elements we want to be exchanging across, uh, across our system through our graph, you know, our, our graph based model. So that's a broad overview of the conceptual framework itself. I'll quickly touch on though on a couple of the, um, the, the op a little bit of the operationalization of the five safes. I'll, I'll take about five more minutes then open up for questions. Um, as I say, just to point out that there is, you know, and we, we're starting to incorporate this into our information model uh, for Cadre, uh, the basics of, you know, there are some frameworks there that we can really use. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on a couple, the data use ontology and the data tag suite um, that we've we've done a you know sort of a, um, a quick you know evaluation you know an evaluation of to see how useful they are for our you know, our environment and what sorts of technologies might sit behind them as well. We do have, um, and I, I won't go into detail. The, the AAF really provide a lot of the the, the starting point for this. The Australian Access Federation um, that we all use, you know, uh, in coordinating access across our systems already. So that's a really nice building block for what we want to do. Um, but then, how do we start expressing some of those more specific types of content we might need for sensitive data access? So the data use ontology is one really helpful one here. Um, uh, this is developed, let's say, by this Global Alliance for for Genomic Health. Um, under the, the Elixir um, uh, EU uh, program. 
And it, it's specifically designed to try and target um, uh, you know, extraction of virtual cohorts um, in um, uh, from from uh, cohort databases uh, in in health and medical research. Um, and so they have a series of you know expressions of you know basically consent information fundamentally. You might have an open access model, but if you have, if you have you know you want to limit access. You need a way of expressing fundamentally what you know. What is the consent model that was there, and how does that actually you know? How can you articulate their ultimate goal is to try and automate that? We won't be totally automating this, but we do need to at least have an information exchange to transfer that information. And it turns out that model is really quite helpful and extensible into other domains, you know, other than health and health and medical. Um, so this notion of general research use, a lot of the modifiers use. This is the the, the overall view of the data use ontology. Um, the modifiers in particular are really largely domain agnostic. Um, so not-for-profit use, not non-commercial use and the like. Um, where you would want to be expressing things is in, you know, in the box health, medical, biomedical, you could simply express something for, might be social sciences or it might be ecology, et cetera. You can imagine extension of this ontology into, into specific domains. And we, we took that and said, okay, would that work? Can we start matching that to our you know, conceptual model and actually lines up fairly well as a way of expressing some of the expect, you know, the access, you know, expectations um, that, that occur um, in our conceptual framework. And so we applied that to a couple of our, uh, couple of our example uh, data sets. Um, <coughs> uh, and, you know, this is kind of a, a first cut mapping of that. Um, reason, they line up reasonably well for trying to articulate what might be, you know, the information you need around expressing who can um, access content, who, you know, what sort of projects are acceptable and the like. Um, the second of these is the data tag suite, and I say, um, is how do we think about the settings in which the content might be accessed as well? How do we enable authentication access is reasonably well understood, but particularly we're interested in this notion of authorization. You know, so how do you actually, what is the, the, the expression of the agreement that you are allowed to access this data. And this is, the, this is really what the data tag suite tries to ex, uh, explore. And it does align with GEO and some other standards as well. Um, so they talk about data authorization being particularly the extension here is, how do you actually get the, you know, the, the acceptance of what is essentially a, 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 you know, a form of contract between the user and the, and the provider and the custodian? Uh, how is that expressed? And fundamentally, what we need to be doing is bringing together the access conditions and the ex, you know the the, the proposal of, of users into an alignment uh, model, and that then both um, the data tag suite and the um, uh, the duo model are really you know premised around that. So there's a really nice you know read through how they think then about how you might link you know both the, the technology and the the systems of provision with the access requirements. And you know, uh, into you know, an overall framework, we try to express that throughout the the framework itself. So there's you know an overview of authentication models, uh, of the types of data access models I just talked about. This is fundamentally a, a simple description of safe. You know, what is safe settings? You'd want a more expressed version of this, but as a starting point for trying to express you know um, the, an overall view, it, this is a good starting point. We would look at how you extend that. We took that, we applied that to, you know, some of the, the cases we have within Australian Data Archive, our access models. It seems to line up fairly well and we continue to apply that across our partners. <laughs> and we were also able to say, well, look, you know, the, the combining the duo and the DATS models, we can get a fairly good expression of the access arrangements um, and the, the proposed, you know, the licensing and, and access conditions that exist for a couple of our sample data sets. And Tender Men is a project that's run by the Australian Institute of Family Studies. Um, where they have a fairly complex access procedure. It's kind of a, one of our work to use cases that's in the, in the framework itself. But ultimately, this is where we want to be going. This is really quite you know, useful from the point of view of um, uh, actually managing this at a national and international level is the frameworks that we're seeing do seem to be, you know, actually there are some domain specific needs. There are a lot of gen generic requirements and Duo, this is really what they're trying to achieve. Don't worry too much about the dot points that are down the bottom, but how do we match on the right hand side the requirements of data custodians for expressing what's acceptable use with on the right hand side the request is what do I want to do with the data, which is my proposed use and my my expression of my you know my alignment with the five safes with what what 
you know, parts of the five saves am I willing to ex accept on the left hand side? So, you know, fundamentally, Geo and the, the GAFHH are trying to get to how do I automate this process? We're trying to look at how do you at least align the information gathering to allow you to do that. All right. I'll skip forward because there's, there's some obvious ways you could kind of collect that. But really, where we get to is um, we have, you know, um, nicely a pretty good alignment of the sorts of, you know, five plus two safes that we're interested in. Um, and we have an expression of the information model itself. Nicely, we also have been able to identify the likely you know, sources we could get for both the expression of um, you know, re access requirements and where the information as to intended use uh, and intended users might come from. And it works, aligns very well, actually, with the identifier models that we have uh, already in place. ORCIDs for people, uh, DOIs for data and probably outputs, organizations, the raw um, research organizations models, um, probably RAIDs, well, we're still clarifying this, uh, for projects. Uh, I'm interested to see the RAID development that's now occurring. Uh, we don't have a good model for groups here, um, what an identifier on groups might be. Um, likely to be much more dynamic, so we'll have to, we're still working that one through. But again, we have an information source based upon the, the technology I, I talked about earlier, CI Logon, which might be, provide the foundations for us to actually be able to do that. And so we've been able to, you know, both um, identify the information requirements and progressively skip over the, the energy relationship diagram. And this is where I'll conclude. It's really now starting to come together in the model and technology. So there are, we're really trying to leverage um, existing technologies where possible. So CI Logon um, and, uh, is um, probably our foundation group and, and access management um, uh, uh, technology. This is um, comes out of uh, out of Illinois. I can't remember the specific organisation. They're presenting as well at eResearch if you're interested. Um, but particularly AAF have brought this to Australia, um, and they're we're actually in pilot now with the Hass Commons, uh, with Cadre, and with the Human Genome Project, which is part of the Australian BioCommons. We're looking at a data uh, a data request and um, uh, resource access uh, management model called REMS. Um, it's com that's coming out of the Elixir program in, in Finland. I can never remember the, the, the details of the, the acronym there. Um, this is already in production at the Garvin Institute in Australia and in the, uh, the Elixir program. And we're piling that as well within um, the Human Genome Project and Cadre. Uh, and colleagues on, you know, some of my team on the call uh, are doing the work at the moment to, you know, to, to actually you know, move that forward. And then the, the piece of work we'll be doing you know, is sort of a you know, bespoke development is really a, a dashboard model for enabling that decision support. Um, so this is new development, particularly working, um, I mean, across the, the, the partners, but particularly with input from uh, Swinburne and Research Graph. I mentioned Amir and uh, Peter, um, Peter Vats uh, with, from AAF and all of our friends within the, the program as a whole. So the next steps really are, are bringing it all together. We've got a technical design and we say so we're doing uh, working on our pilot um, implementation at the moment, uh, and there'll be more on this soon. So, you know, more, more to follow and say, hopefully in the new year, we'll be looking at, you know, doing a, a, a bit of a show and tell on that as well. I've got more, but as I say, I think I'll leave it at this point um, to, you know, open up the floor. Thanks, Steve. And um, yeah, we do already have a question um, in the chat, but uh, if anyone else has any questions, then now's the time to throw them in. But um, can you explain or provide a few words about how ONDC's current consultation on the data code relates to this important work? The former is causing some angst at the Indigenous Data Network as it appears to make it more difficult for Indigenous groups to access their government research data about their own communities. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, <laughs> um, it, I, look, I haven't gone far enough into the code yet to be able to say that. I mean, what I would say is um, is really um, the code itself, data data place and the and the um, the data act um, were kind of the impetus for this work, but this is not actually an implementation to, su to directly support the data act. Um, that said, I think you know um, what we you know learnings we can actually get from at least some of the conceptual work we've done here should re, you know should really inform a response you know uh, to the code itself um so i think you know how we might think about you know access control well, the governance of access control and and, and the like you know that, that that that's relevant here um probably is informative 
for thinking about the the code itself. And so unfortunately, I haven't had time to look enough into the code at this point, um, <laughs> being too be too, too hands with other parts of what the ONDC is doing, in fact. Um, yeah, but there is, as I say, there are sort of coordinate efforts certainly going on through uh, through the IDN um, uh, that I'd encourage people to, uh, to respond to. Um, I think the IDN is also pushing to extend the, the consultation period on the code itself. Yeah, we have a, a note here, submissions for that data codes due tomorrow. <laughs> um, and yep, uh, uh, thanks from the audience for that answer. Uh, are there any other questions? I might pick up a little bit further on Marcus's work, a uh, question that came before. Um, I sort of mentioned it, you know, about relationship with the ABS. Um, so you might know, say, I mean, in terms of our government agency uh, partners, Marcus, um, we did um, uh, say we kind of leveraged uh, activities we were already doing. Um, so um, and uh, in terms of thinking about how, you know, how and who to bring on board in the first stages. Um, so we already had that, you know, we already had the ABA, uh, sorry, we already had AFES and, and, and uh, HW in the mix. And so trying to manage three, you know, you know, big, you know, uh, government agency partners in that process, we thought might be a little bit challenging. Um, but I say I'm, I'm, you know, we've, we've talked particularly to uh, some of the microdata access uh, group um, in um, uh, the ABS, uh, some of the, uh, the university partnerships um, um, uh, team that are at, at the ABS as well, um, and are looking aggressively as to you know how you know how we continue to bring them into the into the mix there we're as I say we're also working on uh, quite actively with the abs and another program um uh, uh the uh, iris which is integrated research infrastructure for social science um and the two are kind of converging so progressively you know there's there's quite a bit of engagement going on there um also people like john newman um who is actually seconded to the ondc at the moment but was quite instrumentally involved while he was at the abs um, has had a bit of a look at this work too. No, I just thought there'd be a good partner here for something that academia needs to be. Um, uh, it'd be really useful if academia could be proactive in in this space because it's a gap in the in the whole national national infrastructure and something that happens. And it would you know, and it would reduce my my work, which is securing uh, sensitive data in databases by more than fifty percent probably. So. Yeah, and, and so I mean, there's, there's an interesting way of thinking about it as well. I mean, it, it, which kind of touches on Sandra's um, uh, question earlier as well. Is what if you know one one of the incentives uh, we were thinking about here is what if we think about a government as a user of data rather than as a provider and custodian of data? Oh yeah, yeah. You, know, oh. so you, turn, you turn this model around, and so Sandra, this is kind of an answer to you, which is you turn this model around if, if you're thinking about communities, you know, uh, communities providing access to their data for government. You know, there's a, a, a you know, there's quite an interesting way of then thinking through um, how governments might be considered trusted users. You know, are they safe people and safe organisations? Um, so that's why we think it's actually quite useful. As that you know, the principles that are relevant here are quite useful because it starts you thinking. Then um, you know, it doesn't have to be you know a one way street here. No, and that's where you'd find the ABS would be thinking the same way. Yeah, they're they're a consumer as well as a, a provider yeah. of data. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And a, yeah. and a lot of agencies have a have a, have a, have a similar way of thinking on that. In in yeah. fact, so let's say on both the on both sides, you know, one of the having worked with across the fence, you know, I've always worked in the university sector, but worked you know um, pretty actively with with agencies for you know for many years hmm. is. The thinking's usually going on, on both sides of the fence, as it were, um, but the 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 outcomes are kind of developed in parallel rather than collaboratively. Yeah. Uh, the more we can do that, the better. Yeah. I'm happy. No, I'm ex ABS. Happy to chat about this offline. Yeah, yeah. that'd be great. Cheers. All right, we're we're heading towards the end. Are there any last pressing questions? Yeah. Quick yeah, um, Aaron? Oh. 
Ah, brilliant. Um, some great work. Is the introductory five safe training course able to be shared with the broader university community just yet? Um, uh, well, with your university, yes, Kim. Um, we're gonna we're actually going to be doing the first pilot uh, on the. Can you give Can you give the date, um, Yolanti? I think it's the twenty eighth um, of. We're doing a first run of it at Melbourne Uni. Um, uh, you know, face to face. We'll be doing another face to face session at ANU. In the in, in the weeks to follow, and an online session. I think we're, we're looking at the eleventh of October, and then we'll also be doing some uh, some work at uh, e research uh, as well. So it's pilot, you know, to be to be clear at this point. Um, so we are looking for feedback you know, on that as well, and we are engaging with a lot of partners on so with SERP and Erica um, on possible exchanges of uh, you know, knowledge exchanges here. Um, but absolutely, we'll be looking to roll that through. Cool. Was, and yeah. as a very interesting question above that I missed that I think maybe requires a longer answer than we can give, but I think it's a really interesting point for discussion. Um, any general thoughts from cadre analysis so far on safe data sets, on the feasibility of describing or codifying what kinds of things make genu data genuinely sensitive beyond the obvious, e.g. personal privacy? Um, also, where is individual consent, e.g. medical trials have this problem? Yeah. Can, I, can I give the two 10 second answers on those? <laughs> yep. Yep. So on, on part one, yeah, we say, I say, I can't remember specifically what I wrote in the, you know, the framework there. We do start that. I mean, that's really the point of that first state section of that review is sensitive, you know, or how you think about what you're looking for in an assessment is fundamentally expression of different people's notions of sensitive. Um, the, the medical medical consent and individual consent, that's what GEO is trying to deal with, quite quite literally. How do you have an expression of that? That's the model that they're really looking towards. So I'd encourage, you know, and happy to provide links to that. Brilliant. Thanks, Steve. Um, okay, I think we will... Um... We'll start to wrap up here. Uh, one of the things I wanted to just quickly do in our last few minutes um, is just throw to the group for any um, uh, suggestions for um, potential future topics that you might be interested in hearing about. Um, it would be, it, it's, I think it's a good idea for us to check in with you every now and then and see what people are most interested in, uh, in hearing from the group in the future. So um, a few topics that are already under consideration. Um, we're looking into um, working with indigenous data, working with defense data, and there are a couple of um, interesting um, e-research sessions coming up, um, including one um, that we're running uh, on uh, the, uh, the point of intersection between data classification and um, security protections. But um, if anyone has any other things that they would be interested in us looking into, um, yeah, now is, now is the time to give us some suggestions. So uh, we've got here working with geospatial data. Uh, does anyone have anything else that they would like to throw in? And this, is, this will be an ongoing, so uh, we'll ask you again next time, but. Could we maybe prod Marcus for uh, yeah a bit more detail? I mean, say working with geospatial data, what kind of topics or what what kind of presenters might be uh, interesting or valuable? Interesting. All right, get someone from um, uh, ABS Geography or Geospatial Solutions. I think it's still called that. Um, uh, perhaps from the A. I used to be the manager of the ASGS. Um, and uh, yeah, the the relationship between what you can output at what spatial scale. Uh, I now work in medical or health research at the University of Canberra, and the research is stymied by the amount of information that's available at the scale that health actually operates at. So that is my interest: um, uh, geographic scale and data availability. So. Um, I could talk to you about who you could talk to at the ABS about perhaps that conversation. Fantastic. We'll be in touch. That sounds okay. really interesting. All right. Cheers. Cool. Well, um, 
then uh, we'll we'll close there. Thank you so much, Steve, for um, for the presentation, and thank you everyone for the really interesting discussion afterwards. Um, and we'll catch you again soon. Thanks, everyone.